I'm Doug Frazier, and this is Stars Among Us. There once was a man in the middle of the sea. His strong arms and chest and legs were lathered in protective oil and grease, forming a shield between him and the frigid November waters of the Baltic. The suit jacket and pants he wore helped some, though he donned them for another reason. When he finally made it to Denmark, he would dry off and blend into the crowd. No one would be the wiser. He would be free. I had the feeling as if any moment I would be caught. So I would try everything. So I definitely tried to swim. The entire journey was two miles, which Hans could finish in about two hours, if he could survive. According to the records, the water reached around 48 degrees that day. He may have been a gifted athlete, but he was still human. In water that cold, exhaustion could set in in as little as 30 minutes, death in just one to three hours. Behind him, his motherland of Germany was under siege for Jews. Staying meant certain death, and without a passport, he had to leave the country illegally. On that day, through that sea, in that suit jacket and pants, Hans would find freedom, or so he'd hoped. What he actually found when he climbed onto the shores was a Danish policeman. The Nazis had yet to march into Denmark, and when they did, the Danes sought to help their Jews. But for now, Hans was not welcome. The officer offered him a choice. He could be turned over to the Danish border police, or he could swim back to Germany. For the second time that day, he stepped from the comfort of land, sank his toes, his legs, his hands, his shoulders, his chin, his chattering teeth, his heavy mind into the frigid Baltic waters and swam. Shadows of faceless creatures passed beneath him. Each stroke brought him closer to a land where genocide slit morality, leaking out unimaginable darkness. A place where a passage from a children's book read, the devil is the father of the Jew. When God created the world, he invented the races, the Indians, the Negroes, the Chinese, and also the wicked creature called the Jew. Adults read these words aloud to their children. The hate would burrow further each year, churning deep beneath the soil by the time they came of age to join the Hitler Youth, by the time their hands were capable of carrying out the thoughts that had been planted, of all times, during their childhood. The concentration camp in Dachau, Germany, had been enlarged almost a year earlier and would grow to contain almost 100 subcamps. Prisoners lived in constant fear of beatings and torture, including standing cells, which were small enough that you couldn't sit down or squat. You stood for days, elbows and knees against the wall, urine and feces burning your skin. A small hole in the ceiling is where air made its way in, and with it, the sound of forced labor the cries of others being tortured. Somewhere among the 206,000 prisoners the Dachau concentration camp took in over its 12 years in operation was Hans's father. A few years earlier, he was with his family at home, waiting for dinner to be served, when a knock came at the door. And I recall vividly that my sister got up, opened the door, and two SS men came into the door and ordered my father to come with them to the police quarters. The police wanted to see him. He had something to, to prove to the police department. It was still a cold evening and my father wanted even to take the overcoat. They did not give him even time enough. What did we all think about it? Let us wait till he comes back but he never came back. First, they took him to Buchenwald, and later to Dachau, where cattle cars were stuffed with human beings and bolted from the outside. A smell wafted through the cars. It was smoke, burning hair and flesh. It was the scent many of them would later give off to the next group of arrivals, a warning. A cycle on repeat until the quota of Jews for the day had been met. Six months passed since that knock at the door, 
not a word from Hans's father or the SS who took him until they heard his name on the radio. The propaganda minister stated that his father had gotten on a train and tried to jump out in Holland with all his money and was caught. He was being held at Buchenwald. Later, Hans and his family found out that if his father had signed over the property to a non-Jewish school, he would have been set free. Give us everything you own because you're Jewish and we'll set you free. Aryanization, they called it, the Nazi term for seizing property from Jews and transferring it to non-Jews. It was a forced expulsion of Jews from economic life in Nazi Germany. Hans's father refused to give in. He paid for it with his property and his flesh. By the time he was released from the concentration camp, he weighed just 80 pounds. They had taken everything from him. Almost. There once was a man in the middle of the sea. Over the soft churning waters, he caught a glimpse of land in the distance. Germany, just a mile away. 5,280 feet between him and the SS. Where does your mind wander when you're swimming toward your own death? Two years earlier, Hans served as a translator for tourists at the Olympic Games in his hometown of Berlin. Berlin's great day dawns with the arrival of the Olympic flame at the end of its 2,000 mile journey from Greece. And meanwhile, a packed stadium and flag-draped cheering streets greet Chancellor Hitler on his way to perform the opening ceremony. Under pressure from the International Olympic Committee, Hitler's government had eased enforcement of the anti-Jewish laws up to and during the games. So they showcased a whitewashed Germany, devoid of the discrimination, propaganda, and violence on the rise against Jews. Zum Feier der elften Olympiade neuer Zeitrechnung als eröffnet. For 14 days, the eyes of the world will be on Berlin, and Germany wants to send away every one of her millions of visitors as a friend. Two months later, Hans was picked up with some other young Jewish men and thrown in the back of an SS truck. He jumped from the truck as it drove through Berlin near the Alexander Platz, the Times Square of Berlin, and went into hiding. But no matter how much he tried to be German, he would not be accepted. He would always be an outsider in their eyes. His life's fire, what little he might have had left, was one encounter away from being snuffed out. After a lifetime of non-acceptance and persecution for being Jewish, Hans needed to get out. You could not make eye contact because you felt if you make eye contact with other people, maybe they saw that you were Jewish. Everybody could shoot me and there would not be any question about it. After all, it was ordered by the government uh, to expel the Jews. I felt like a deer and it was deer season. He was now living illegally relying on the kindness of friends and strangers alike who would let him spend a night in their home. Other times he slept on the street or the subway, whatever worked for the night, only to wake up and keep moving. It was the only way to avoid capture. A confidant warned him there had been SS with German shepherds at the borders for the past month, making sure no one could get out. He said, I could try one thing, to swim to swim from Flensburg to Sonderhaven. That was on the 1st of November, 1938. There once was a man in the middle of the sea. It wasn't always like this. He was happy once, free. Then the world swept him up, dressed him in a suit, and shoved him into the Baltic. A week after the failed swim, Hans was looking for a place to sleep when mobs around Berlin tore into the night. All of a sudden, two, three trucks full of SS men came and jumped out of the truck and threw firebombs into the synagogue building. The fire brigades came not to uh, distinguish the fire, but just to make sure that the fire would not spray over to other houses which were close by. It would become known as Kristallnacht, 
the night of broken glass. 7,500 Jewish-owned businesses were attacked and 96 Jews were killed as passing clouds flickered with the oranges and reds of a burning city. When the flames died, everywhere you looked, stocks of food and clothing and religious trinkets and paintings by skilled Jewish artists whose families had spent generations honing their craft were now indistinguishable from ash. Those who survived and weren't deported to camps were charged one billion Reichmarks to clean up the destruction. The Nazis destroyed and the Jews paid. But even in the face of insurmountable destruction, it seems hope finds a way. Hope for Hans arrived in the form of a passport given to him by, of all people, an SS officer. The officer had been his former schoolmate. During their youth, Hans defended the man against bullies and put up a fight for what he saw was an injustice. And in this former schoolmate's own way, he was returning the favor. With financial help from a Zionist organization, he bought a train ticket to Italy and eventually reunited with his parents in Shanghai, one of the few places taking Jewish refugees who didn't have a passport. Over in Shanghai, 18,000 Jewish refugees lived in a cramped, square-mile area known as the Hongku Ghetto. Honda's mother would die there the day after the war ended, her grave later destroyed by the Red Brigade. Hans Lowenbach wouldn't be buried until age 96. He still had work to do. In 1947, with the war two years finished, Hans and his pregnant wife, Ruth, needed to choose where to emigrate. And they chose America. This is their daughter, Miriam. He was on the streets of Manhattan. He loved to go into the city. He liked, reminded him of Berlin. So he would go in and he started just sketching window displays. And he was sketching a window display or something. And a guy walked behind him and was looking, I guess, watching him sketch and said, I want you to draw something for me. And he pulled him to another window and said, can you draw this? And he, he sketched them and he said, I want to hire you. The business was called the Custom Shop Shirt Company. Hans worked there for 35 years and it still exists to this day. Into his later years, Hans continued swimming, his body shades of strength away from that day he took twice to the frigid Baltic waters. Still, he moved through the water at pace as though if the world were at his heels, he could swim forever. He may have left the sea, but the sea never left him. I had a dream last night. I saw the ocean saw a fight. The fight of people for their history. I saw the birth of a nation running towards its own extinction. I saw them digging, digging, looking for something. And I saw them drowning in their own coffin. Stars Among Us is brought to you by the Holocaust Commission of the United Jewish Federation of Tidewater and other fine sponsors, and has been funded in part by a grant from Virginia Humanities. If you're interested in finding out more about the Holocaust and Hans Lowenbach's story, please visit holocaustcommission.org slash starsamongus. Our producer is Elka Mennick. Our executive producers are Wendy Juran Auerbach and Gail Ligwin-Flax. Stars Among Us is distributed by WHRO Public Media.